uh, thank you for joining us today. Good to see you all. So as you know, uh, in Snohomish County, we've had three mass vaccination sites functioning for almost a month now. And we are looking to set up more. Um, in fact, we hope to have another opening this week. We currently have the capacity to vaccinate 30,000 people per week in our three mass vaccination sites alone. And that is separate from the private capacity in, in hospitals and clinics and, and other places. So 30,000 just by the county is our capacity. We are hoping in future to get enough supply of the vaccine to be able to do 50,000 doses per week. Um, we were asked often to let people know when we'll have vaccine and uh, the schedule will be we really don't know that week to week until we get our allocation from the state each week. So unfortunately, we can't give people uh, real advance notice. Uh, we wish we could plan further into the future too, but again, uh, we're on a week by week allocation from the state. So if we have the vaccine supply for at least 50,000 first doses per week, we would be able to get everybody in the county vaccinated in under 20 weeks. Uh, we believe getting shots into the arms is the most urgent priority. It's how we will save lives and be able to keep thousands of people from getting sick. And it's our goal to get everybody in the county vaccinated as soon as possible. Uh, the bottleneck really still is supply. I do want to thank the state for being so responsive to our vaccine needs. We have steadily been getting more vaccine each week. And this week, uh, we expect to receive over 17,000 doses. And that's a major improvement. So I know the problem rests uh, at the federal level, uh, and we are urging our federal delegation to do everything they can to ensure our state is getting the necessary doses. The sooner we can get everybody vaccinated, the sooner we can put this pandemic behind us. Uh, from our stressed healthcare systems to the many businesses and workers, who are under extreme economic pressure, every delay is providing vaccines, uh, just compounds the suffering. So I'm really proud uh, that Snohomish County is leading the way with our mass vaccination sites. And we are totally committed to staying on emergency footing until we get every willing resident vaccinated. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Spitters from the Snohomish Health District. Well, thank you, Executive Summers, and uh, good morning, everyone. Today, I'd like to provide some updates on our COVID cases, a little more about the B117 variant of the coronavirus that was announced over the weekend, and an update on uh, vaccination distribution and administration in Snohomish County. Uh, first, let's talk about current uh, COVID trends. And I haven't shown you um, data in a while and with, uh, with our moderator's uh, assistance or, or uh, permission, I'm just gonna briefly share a couple of slides. There we go. So the first thing we're seeing here is the rolling two week rate. We just posted this yesterday. This extends up through January 23 and uh, hearteningly shows a decrease from 376 down to 253, a substantial decline. Uh, that's cases per 100,000 residents in the 14 days ending January 23. This is the lowest we've been since mid-November and it's a welcome reprieve from the surge of the last few months. Uh, hospitals are also reporting a drop in their census. Uh, you can see the new admissions have declined uh, over the last several weeks and the total number of patients in the hospital due to COVID right now is in the mid 50s. Uh, we were almost double that two weeks ago. So that as well is a substantial improvement. Uh, I'll just show you also uh, cases coming out of long-term care facilities declining. Uh, and although substantial number of deaths are still occurring, those are declining as well. So I'm gonna come back and stop sharing and continue with the comments. Um, so this is all good news and I'm grateful for everyone's efforts, uh, both in the response as well as just individuals at the community level for all the efforts and sacrifices to get us here. But we can't celebrate too soon or let our guard down or this is gonna come right back as it has before. And it's good to remember, as I showed you, that while case counts and hospital numbers are going down, 
we've still lost more than 65 residents due to COVID just since the first of the year. That's two to three lives per day in our community because of this virus. So we're far from being out of the woods and we're still in a precarious position with a, a declining trajectory, but still a very high level of transmission. So while we're all working hard to secure enough vaccine for Snohomish County, we need everyone out there to keep working just as hard on all those prevention measures we've been uh, implementing all along to try to keep these numbers down and, and push them down further. We still all need to wear masks regardless of our vaccine status. We need to keep our social bubbles small and avoid crowds, don't host gatherings and don't attend gatherings. And we need to be diligent with hand washing and sanitizing high touch surfaces in our homes and workplaces. These measures are particularly important with the emergence of the B117 variant, also known as the UK variant uh, because it was first detected in, uh, in the London metropolitan area in December. It has now been confirmed uh, over the weekend in at least two Snohomish County residents, as well as in a Pierce County resident. While I can't share any potentially identifying details about the individuals and it would not further our public health efforts, I can tell you that the affected individuals have recovered. They were not hospitalized. They experienced mild or asymptomatic illness. There was no travel involved with these cases, either uh, the ill persons traveling themselves or being exposed to people who had recently traveled. So we know they acquired the infection in Snohomish County. Current estimates suggest that 0.2% of COVID infections in Washington state are due to this strain. Although these are the first detected B117 variants in the state, and as I mentioned, another one recently uh, in Pierce County as well, it is highly likely that other cases exist and will be found through ongoing surveillance as time elapses. While this is a cause for concern, it's not a alarm bell. There's no need for us to get alarmed. It was only a matter of time for one of these variants to emerge here in Washington state. This variant, the B117, has been shown to be more transmissible, meaning it's easier to spread from one person to another. That's based on data from the UK showing that on average, contacts of the B117 strain uh, get infected about 15% of the time, whereas contacts of all other strains uh, get infected about 11% of the time. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention anticipates that due to this uh, capacity to spread more easily, the B117 variant may be the predominant circulating strain in the United States within several months. The jury is still out on whether this strain is associated with greater severity of infection, but the higher rate of transmission associated with this strain could lead to more cases increasing the number of people who need hospitalization and further burdening an already strained healthcare system. While we are unlikely to be able to impact the proportion of total cases that this strain represents in the long run, we all can have an impact on the total amount of COVID circulating in the community. And again, that's why it's even more important than ever that we all continue to consistently take the steps mentioned above that prevent the spread of the virus. It's also critical that vaccine supply, distribution, and administration proceed ahead promptly, as Executive Summers has mentioned, so that we can achieve high coverage of the population before this variant or any other variant uh, that brings with it greater transmissibility or greater severity of disease before anything like that comes and circulates widely enough to cause another health surge and more death. On the vaccine front, the Snohomish County continues to make good progress on administering the, the limited vaccines that we have received. Just over 20,000 vaccines were administered last week. That brings us up to 42,000 doses, uh, 42,000 people who have received at least one dose and close to 7,000 who are now fully vaccinated with two doses. As we noted last week, we only received uh, three to four vaccines uh, last or three to 4,000 vaccines last week. I'm relieved to see that we currently are slated to receive 17,000 doses this week. The Department of Health has, told, has been told that distributions of the Moderna vaccine to Washington State 
are expected to increase in early February, and we're also watching the progress of a couple of other vaccines in the pipeline that are in the, the uh, final stages of clinical trials, bringing hope of one or two more vaccines coming on the market uh, within a month or two. So while we have even more hope on the horizon, our current vaccine supply is still much less than the demand that's out there. With close to 200,000 people eligible under phase 1A and 1B1 combined, all trying to get limited slots available for their first or second dose, this has led to local providers as well as the Snohomish County Vaccine Task Force sites being quickly uh, booked out for appointments. We know people are frustrated that appointments aren't currently open. Uh, we urge your patience with this. It may not be to today or tomorrow or even this week, but you will get an appointment soon. We said it would be one to two months to move from phase 1A to 1B1, and it's been about six weeks. We've also been sharing that it will take several months to work through phase 1B1, and we're only a week in. So, uh, you know, we can't all get it right away, and it's going to take uh, a couple of months to get, to get through everyone. People will get appointments for their shots, but it's going to take time, which brings me to a question we've been receiving quite a bit. Is there an approval or an appeal process to get vaccinated early? And the short answer to that is no. As I shared last week, it's important to understand that where people currently land in the prioritization scheme or the, the vaccine phases is not a reflection on their value to society or in this community. If we had unlimited vaccine supply and clinical capacity to administer it, we would just take care of it you know, virtually instantaneously and prioritization would not be necessary. But neither of those are the case. We don't have unlimited vaccine supply and we are building up quite a uh, robust um, administration capacity, but even that is, is um, not unlimited. This is why until vaccines really start flowing into Washington State and Snohomish County at higher and more predictable pace, there's going to continue to be a need to prioritize the limited capacity and it's not necessarily directed toward those at higher risk of acquiring the infection, but rather for those most likely to become severely ill, requ require hospitalization and or die if they get infected. There are a lot of compelling, compelling reasons why someone should get vaccinated early, and we, we wish we could grant all those requests, but we can't. Instead, those who are not eligible need to keep following all the public health measures to limit exposure uh, before, during, and after vaccination. Waiting your turn in line also frees up resources to more expeditiously move through phase 1B1 so we can move on to the next one as soon as possible. The last piece on vaccines for today is about the second dose. We continue to get questions about second dose allocations and appointments for second doses. Second doses in the, the vaccine accounting system are allocated and ordered separately from first doses, and those are sent directly to the vaccine provider from the manufacturer. No second doses are being saved or, or pulled out of the first dose allocations that are being sent only designated second doses can be saved and administered as second doses. For those who have already received your first vaccine, please work with the same healthcare provider, clinic, or pharmacy to schedule your second appointment. Just as supplies are extremely limited for people trying to get their first dose, similar challenges are the case for those needing their second dose. There may be the need for healthcare providers to postpone or reschedule your appointment if vaccine supplies do not arrive as expected. According to federal guidelines, individuals should receive two doses of the Moderna vaccine at least 28 days apart, or in the case of the Pfizer vaccine, two doses at least 21 days apart. These are considered the minimal intervals and the amount of time needed to separate the two doses to uh, get the right uh, um, boost from that second dose. Um, but even after, uh, but there is no maximum cutoff. Uh, that can, you know, it's ideal to get it within six weeks, but if you end up getting it at seven or eight or 10 weeks down the line, you don't have to restart the series. Uh, the second dose will, will, will do it. People should not be concerned about the two dose series efficacy if the second dose is delayed. 
And even after the second dose is received, we all need to continue all the prevention measures we've been mentioning until we signal that they're no longer necessary. That is going to extend beyond when most people get vaccinated. For those vaccinated at one of the Snohomish County Vaccine Task Force drive-through sites in, uh, in um, uh, Edmonds, Monroe, or Everett, please look for a separate email being sent prior to the date you are due for the second dose of the vaccine with information on how to register for that second dose. The Snohomish County Vaccine Task Force is working to get everyone who has received their first shot at one of the drive through sites in for a second dose as close to the 28 day mark as possible. But again, there may be some need for flexibility and understanding on uh, your part as we work our way through that, that scheduling uh, bottleneck. Even after you're vaccinated, again, continue to wear a mask in shared spaces, avoid large gatherings, stay home if you feel ill, wash your hands, clean and sanitize surfaces. And if you get ill or are notified that you're a contact, uh, you still need to follow the isolation and quarantine guidelines and seek testing. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Executive Summers. Thank you, doctor. And I'm, some of these questions are related, but I'm going to go through them one by one anyway, so we, we get a um, response to each one. So uh, the first is new state data show that in the number of vaccinations given per 10,000 residents, Snohomish County only ranks 28th. Why are we so low, uh, considerably behind King, Pierce, Spokane counties? And I'll start, I'll give you a minute, but uh, it's absolutely related to supply. Uh, the low supply we've been getting in Snohomish County. Uh, as I mentioned, we've had uh, mass vaccination sites uh, stood up now. On Wednesday, it'll be one month that we've had those open. So uh, it's been a bit frustrating, but we know it's related to the supply that comes into the state that has to be allocated out to the various counties. But the reason we're so low is we believe we just weren't getting quite an equitable uh, apportionment of vaccine, but that's uh, beginning to change now. So, Doctor, anything to add to that? Uh, supply, supply, supply. Supply, supply, supply. Uh, next question uh, about the Spanish language church Casa de Restauración in Montlake Terrace. Sorry about that. Uh, it operates in the same building as Bethel Chapel. The pastor admitted that they were not wearing masks inside during services and that you contacted them about it. Was there an investigation into their practices and what were your findings? And have there been any cases linked to that church? And what happens when you find out a place of worship is not following the rules? So multi-part question. Yeah, let's, let's uh, unlayer that one. So first, with respect to the specific church in question, we did receive a complaint about that church. We sent, uh, uh, we have a, a procedure for such complaints and we sent a letter to the church after those complaints. They called with some clarifying questions, but were cooperative with the, uh, with the uh, interaction and our epidemiology team uh, checked and there have been no apparent cases or outbreaks linked to that church. So that's the situation there. Uh, going back to the, the additional layers of your questions, um, when we find out that a place of worship is not following the rules put in place to prevent the spread of virus, what happens? Well, we, we, um, one, we, we lodge a complaint in the governor's uh, um, inbox for uh, uh, enforcement of the governor's proclamations. And that's, that is where the direction is coming from uh, around these. We endorse the governor's direction uh, to follow all these recommendations. But, you know, honestly, we also have to be, uh, you know, we have, only so many resources. And with all the containment efforts we're trying to do on uh, uh, workplace, healthcare, outbreak control, uh, routine case investigation, contact investigations, and rolling out the vaccine, we've got to balance um, making progress in all those lanes of activity uh, with uh, enforcement. You know, and in general, we're not really a you know, we don't have badges and handcuffs. So we do the best we can to get people to uh, cooperate. Uh, uh, occasionally, if something were to seem uh, truly an imminent threat uh, to the immediate community, we might take further enforcement action or ask the state uh, to do so. 
uh, but we, you know, we're, we're trying to take a balanced approach, focusing on promoting uh, rash, you know, ra reasonable act behavior and cooperating with basic uh, measures and thinking of the well-being of others. And occasionally we get uh, folks that aren't completely on the playing field there and we continue to try to work to get them back on that playing field. So another one uh, for you, doctor. Is there any COVID vaccination option in the works for kids under the age of 16? Any compassionate use for kids with underlying conditions? Well, I believe uh, some, I think there's ongoing clinical trials with, um, you know, the Moderna and, and Pfizer vaccines in the initial phase three trials didn't include kids. But I think some of the uh, ongoing uh, work will address kids. I don't know how soon that will come. And that's just been driven by, although there are some severe outcomes in children, most, uh, mostly related to the, that um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome that's a post-COVID uh, autoimmune reaction. Uh, you know, there are other kids who get severely ill, hospitalized, and, you know, and, uh, and have even died. But, um, you know, as the public health effort goes, they're, they're really trying to focus on adults. Ultimately, some solution, I think, will come along to include kids, uh, but there's nothing uh, immediately on the horizon there. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> do you suspect raising concerns last week about your vaccination allocation and media coverage of it contributed to the large increase in doses allocated to the county this week? And I'll start on that one. I, absolutely, yes. Um, we are in contact. I know my office is in contact. The health district and our Dep Department of Emergency Management talk to the state at multiple levels every day. And when we saw the, the numbers compared to other counties, we definitely uh, raised a concern and we can consistently do that every day. So I had an old friend suggest that we needed to be a squeaky wheel. I just want to assure everybody we are squeaking loudly uh, through official channels and um, we understand the challenges the state faces and uh, if the federal government also has uh, got some challenges there but uh, these early days are going to be a little rough but we are definitely communicating our needs and our capability. So, doctor? Anything else? Nothing to add, Executive Summers. So Dr. Spitters, how worried are you about the new variant uh, turning the numbers in the wrong direction? And should people be doubling up on masks to better protect against the new variant? Uh, well, I, I really see two questions there. Uh, how worried am I about the new variant? Well, uh, you know, concerned enough that we brought it to your attention. Uh, and again, I, the, the key thing is it's a, it's a little more slippery than this already slippery virus. It's, it's able to transmit uh, a little bit easier, uh, at least, you know, 15% versus 11%. So at least one third more transmissible. Uh, I've seen, you know, some reports saying it's 50 to 70%. I'm, I'm not sure the exact figure matters that much, but there's now a strain of this virus out there that is going to take a, you know, it's going to outcompete the the other strains, uh, and and uh, just by sheer force of numbers could put us back, uh, take us back to levels of transmission that we don't want in terms of suffering, illness, hospitalization, and death. Uh, I'm confident though that we all have within our minds and our you know, physical capacity, the ability to follow these, this guidance to um, limit that impact. And if we get the vaccine rolling out, uh, you know, we should be able to um, not allow this B117 variant to have a, a big negative impact or disrupt our general progress toward trying to exit from this, this state of emergency. Regarding the double masks, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, this, the old adage uh, is not always true. You know, if some is good, more is better. But in general, if you add a second mask, um, conceptually, you're, you're, it's like having, it's going back to the Swiss cheese model, right? If you have two slices of Swiss cheese, there's fewer holes uh, for something to get through. So it makes intuitive sense that uh, double masking would, would, would uh, increase uh, one's protection uh, and one's ability to protect others. Um, and some of you might have heard Dr. Fauci mention this yesterday on, uh, I think it was the Today Show, 
having said this, I am not a, an expert in uh, the physics of mask wearing, and nor am I the the one to establish, you know, na nationwide uh, um, mask recommendations. But we'll see, we'll see where this goes about whether you know the marginal benefit, the additional increment in benefit from doubling up a mask you know, is worth the effort. I, I think if you're able to do it, it doesn't make you uncomfortable, uh, great, why not? And, uh, but certainly our, our goal is everyone wearing a mask uh, for starters. And then if you want to double up, uh, no one's certainly, no one's going to stop you. And it may turn out that that evolves into a recommendation. So we're hearing a significant concern about B117 uh, from other health officials who suggest a volcanic volcano-like explosion in cases and months ahead. Do you agree with this assessment? Well, uh, you know, um, it, it's definitely likely to work, you know, start displacing as if, you know, if it's able to move around faster, it's going to start displacing uh, the, the, you know, the other strains. And uh, you can look at last Friday's uh, MMWR article about this. It has a nice graphic showing uh, CDC's modeling of it. I, I don't know that I'd characterize it as a volcano, although I'm sympathetic to the sentiment behind that, that this, you know, absent the prevention measures that we're talking about, uh, you know, this could uh, take us in a direction we don't want to see things go. I think it is within our hands to, to stem the spread of it. Uh, and it is a threat uh, to our health and hospitals, and especially our older uh, adults, if we don't follow those uh, recommendations to try to keep a lid on this. Dr. Spiders, can you tell us more about how the department reacted to the two patients found to be infected by the UK strain? Did full contact tracing happen with both isolation and proper quarantine measures? Yes, all, all of the above, as we mentioned in the press release over the weekend, the, the cases were handled uh, completely uh, by us and per routine before we knew about the results on the B117. And uh, because the, uh, there's no, the, the, the control and containment measures for B117 are no different than for the other strains. So, uh, th there's really no need to do more, and uh, uh, all of that isolation, quarantine of contacts, all that's uh, been taken care of. Well, uh, one provider CEO said 45% of the county's allotment could be shifted toward the mass vaccination sites. Is this the case? And uh, uh, additional question, should people expect almost a lottery type appointment system where a few slots are open each week and filled within hours for the foreseeable future. Well, I'll 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 take a, a shot at that, and then please follow up, uh, Executive Summers. Uh, that's what we're told to. That forty-five percent of the state's allocation will be directed to seven um, uh, mass vaccination sites. Four that the state is setting up, and and then uh, in three counties, uh, King Pierce and Snohomish, to, to uh, augment or supply mass vaccination sites already set up by the, the counties in those settings. Uh, so that still leaves 55% uh, of the supply going to the healthcare system, hospitals, pharmacies, trying to provide a, you know, a, a multi-sector, multi-venue um, palette of options for people. Uh, having said that, uh, let's say we have enough doses to do 20,000, 30,000 a week through our mass sites, and we have 200,000 people um, uh, that are roughly, that are ready, willing, and able to get vaccinated, then if 200,000 people go in and try to schedule 20,000 appointments, it, it's a one in 10 chance that you're going to get a, an appointment that week. And then it'll be about a, an 11% chance the next week, and then 15, and then you know ultimately we will get through that. And so um, I don't know that I'd call it a lottery, but people are going to have to you know go to phase, find my phase wa.org, find your phase, and if your phase is up, then you you you, can't, you know if you can't get vaccinated through your health your own healthcare system your own. Healthcare provider or a local pharmacy, you know, 
you got to kind of go to those websites uh, probably every day and check check to see if you can get a spot. And ultimately, it'll get easier and easier and easier. And then we'll saturate that 1v1 group and then move on to the next. And that cycle will likely repeat itself. I'd like to add that we are talking with the healthcare providers and the private sector uh, all the time uh, within the county. And as we go through this, I think uh, hopefully we'll be nimble and get the vaccines uh, to the right place and to be the most efficient. Uh, the mass vaccination sites have the uh, really benefit of being an advantage of being much quicker. We can move people through much faster than you can in more of a clinical situation. Uh, whether it's a hospital or clinic. So there's some definite advantages. And as we get into this and the supply increases, we will definitely try to be nimble. Um, in terms of the online appointment system, we think it's working well. The problem, as we've said, is not enough supply. So I know people are frustrated when they get online and can't get an appointment, uh, but I think that's better than getting in your car and getting in line somewhere and then being turned away because there's no vaccine. So. Uh, we think the system has some advantages and that people know ahead of time when they show up, they're going to be able to get a vaccine. And uh, so we're going to keep with that system and, unless somebody points the direction to something better. Um, so Dr. Spitters, Dr. Fauci said Sunday that the UK variant does in fact cause more damage, including even death. Uh, do you disagree or why or why not? Right. Well, uh, He's a pretty sharp guy in a well well placed position, and and he also has access to data. I didn't hear the comment you're quoting, but I I did see his his uh, interview yesterday on the Today Show, and the comment I heard was, uh, you know, it hasn't formally come out yet, but UK uh, scientists are suggesting it may be more severe. He said, I've looked at the data, and I think maybe they're right. Um, so uh, a local health official in Washington State. Uh, commenting on, you know, uh, interpretation of events that's happening across the country and across the ocean. I think we just got to wait and see, but keep our mind open that it seems that that's a possibility. And let's wait till we see some solid information about that. I, I haven't seen the data and no, I don't challenge Dr. Fauci's interpretation of what's going on. I just don't have the, uh, the, the window on the situation that, that he and others do. Uh, what does the current COVID data say about the possibility of advancing to the next phase of the state's regional reopening plan? And Executive Summary, as you've mentioned, concern about being held back because of other counties. Are you concerned now? Well, certainly the trends are in the right direction and we're getting to be in a pretty good place, but uh, there's some warning signs. Uh, this new variant uh, obviously is one, so we're going to have to wait and see if uh, there's a with the, any change in the numbers, direction of numbers, but certainly if we consider and continue in a downward trend and are meeting all the criteria, we've already let the governor's office know that we would be asking to be cut off from or split off from the rest of the region. Uh, we're in discussions with the state every day about this issue and we know we're not the only ones with this concern. Again, we're hopeful, uh, we're headed in the right direction, but we're gonna have to give it some more time before we uh, make any uh, requests of the state on that. Um, um, next question, how much does the vaccine dose allocation to the county vary week to week from the state and do you know why? Have you asked the state for a guaranteed minimum number of doses? You want to start on that? Yeah, uh, well, you know, uh, I would say there's great variability both in the absolute and the proportional number of doses uh, that we've been getting. I think Executive Summers expressed our concern about us feeling like we're at the, at the you know, short end of the stick a little bit lately. Uh, on the, and, and so I, and I endorse that and I'm really happy that we've been able to try to get that to be better. I think out of uh, deference to our state colleagues uh, who are doing their best to, you know, they're, they're, uh, their charge is the state, and there are additional uh, interests that they have beyond Snohomish County. Certainly, our charge is to do the best we can for Snohomish County, but there are criteria beyond, you know, population and per capita allocations. I think ultimately, you know, it will, uh, 
more and more our allocations will approximate some type of per capita uh, index. But there have been early on, there have been other uh, criteria that the state have used and that didn't work out so well for us, uh, but, but I'm confident that as time goes ahead, uh, more and more uh, our, our allocations will meet or exceed uh, our per capita um, due. And we would actually love to have a guaranteed minimum or some stable number, but I don't think that the state has that uh, luxury either uh, from the supply from the, the federal stockpile. So uh, it's a bit of a system that's still getting up and running. Uh, the state has to allocate out to 39 counties. We understand that's not an easy proposition. Uh, but they have been increasing our supply and we're uh, glad for that. So uh, will the mass vaccination sites open appointments at the same time each week once doses arrive? Uh, and how should people, especially older folks, know when to look? And I, I guess that's uh, a question on when there's an announcement that on the website that there are spots available. Right, right. Yeah, we, uh, we um, generally find out what's coming on Monday, and then the, the vaccine sites would then, you know, start setting up uh, appointments based on that allocation. So I would expect, at least in the short run, while we don't have great vision down the road, and we're just, you know, responding to what's happening this very week, things probably would open up Monday afternoon, Tuesday, usually, and and so that would be the time to start looking on Monday, look a couple times Monday, look early on Tuesday, that kind of thing. Uh, I think the second half of your question addresses a, a, a key um, equity issue, especially regarding age, but also just any you know, access connectivity and, and fluency in dealing with the internet is gonna vary across age groups, across populations and parts of the county. And, we're trying to, uh, there's a variety of ways we're planning to try to address that. It's not, not like everything's in place, but uh, I think as we look a few weeks down the road, uh, people who are unable to successfully connect or unable to navigate the internet, um, you know, we'll find alternatives for them to, to get registered other than online. And, uh, you know, in the long run, I think uh, also outreach oriented vaccination efforts, either mobile vaccination uh, operations or pop up clinics are, are likely to be a another means to mitigate some of the uh, challenges that that um, uh, certain folks face in trying to get connected to this system and get vaccinated. Two more questions. Uh, for phase 2A, is the first group firmly teachers? And there are police, firefighters, and other essential workers listed in that pool also. Yeah. I, one, I don't think that, I think the 2A uh, guidance is currently draft, unless I've missed a recent finalization of that. So there was a framework they put up, but everything beyond 1B4 is still draft. Um, I think the principle is that any of those groups that you just mentioned, uh, essential workers who uh, can't socially distance in, uh, while executing their jobs. And that would include most school staff, law enforcement, firefighters. Uh, again, many of them are gonna be covered in the 1B phases based on their age. And, um, and then, you know, anybody who's essential workers and hasn't been done yet, I think more or less their turn is all gonna come up simultaneously uh, in two. Um, but I, I don't really want to venture detailed guesses on draft framework. We'll just see as that evolves. As we move through 1B, then we'll start dialing in on the details of uh, subsequent phases. So Dr. Fitters, I'm still hearing from quite a few people who say even when it is their turn to get vaccinated, they do not plan to. Uh, can you speak to what that means in Snohomish County and for the state as a whole, if there's not enough buy-in? Well, you know, the goal is, uh, the goal is, as Executive Summers has said, the goal is, uh, you know, to get everyone vaccinated. Uh, the, the um, I would say the, you know, the, uh, the goal with the, with the civil uh, liberties uh, aspect to it is that everybody who wants to get vaccinated gets vaccinated and, um, and can do so, you know, in a reasonably timely fashion over the next six to eight months, I would say at most. 
Um, we don't want anyone to avoid vaccination out of, you know, fear. Uh, certainly, uh, so, you know, we're, we're, we want to help people understand transparently what the benefits, the risks are of the vaccine, what the side effects are. And, uh, and some people, you know, still might not be comfortable getting vaccinated uh, even after they have that information. What we really want is everyone to make an informed choice. Our, our goal again is universal coverage. If not, it'd be great to at least get up around 75, 80%, which is the guesstimate number for proportion of the population that we'd need to successfully interrupt transmission or achieve herd immunity. Um, but you know, we're not gonna, at least uh, I, I don't see in our forecast forcing anyone to get vaccinated. So uh, we just wanna have people get access to the information to make an informed choice. And then if they elect to do so, then be able to pursue it. And uh, that's the best we can do. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to add, Dr. Smithers alluded to this. <clears throat> we are uh, planning for quite a few outreach efforts in, uh, like pop-up clinics, vaccination sites for uh, various communities that may be more um, uh, either have access difficulties or are skeptical uh, in, in their uh, community about vaccines. And we're going to be uh, really using the connections that we made during the census last year, uh, community connections, community leaders to stand up these efforts. We're an extremely diverse county. Um, we've got many, many racial and ethnic uh, and religious communities uh, throughout the county. And we understand that um, uh, targeting them and making vaccine available on a community level is really important. We've seen that, uh, for example, up at Tulalip, uh, that it was really a community effort. And uh, we think that's a, a great model. So those plans are in place. We need the vaccine supply really to increase uh, before we can get those going. But those, those plans are in place and uh, we're standing ready to do that so that we get just the maximum number of people uh, vaccinated that we can. So I think that's it. All right. This is Kristen in the Joint Information Center. Thank you for joining us today and please stay tuned for future media availabilities.